Good morning to each of you joining us for this study of God's Word. We hope that you're having a wonderful weekend, and we extend a warm welcome to you to worship with us this morning at Pyburn Street Church of Christ at 10 o'clock. At Pyburn Street, you will find a loving and encouraging group of God's people who want only to follow God's will for our lives, make it to heaven, and help you get there as well. If we can be of assistance to you in any way, please let us know. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Jesus says during his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. According to Sigmund Freud, the dominant human desire is the desire for pleasure. Well, Freud was wrong. People have more basic and more powerful needs. Among these is the need for food and water. The Bible has a number of examples of how strong the motivation of hunger can be. Take, for example, Esau in Genesis 25, 37 through 34, or 27 through 34, who became so hungry that for one morsel of food he sold his birthright to his brother. Then there was the rich man in torment in Luke 16 and verse 24 who cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Jesus understood both hunger and thirst in the wilderness in Matthew 4 and verse 2, where for forty days and forty nights he fasted and became very hungry. And then later on the cross in John 19.28, Jesus said, I thirst. But what is the meaning of righteousness? In both the Greek and the English, the heart of the word righteousness is the word right. When applied to God, the word means right being, or this is absolute rightness. God is the only one who is right in every respect. Now when applied to people, the word can have two different meanings. The first is right living. We see in 1 John 2 and verse 29, since we know that Christ is righteous, We also know that all who do what is right are God's children. 1 John 3 and verse 7, Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. When people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. And then 1 John 3 and verse 10, So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love their believers or love other believers does not belong to God. Friends, none of us can live perfectly. So this is a relative rightness. Now the second meaning is right standing with the Lord. We are not actually righteous. Psalm 143 and verse 2 says, For in your sight no one living is righteous. Romans 3 and verse 10, Paul says, There is none righteous, no, not one. But God counts us as righteous when we believe in Jesus and obey his gospel and do his will. In Romans 4 and verse 3, Paul writes, For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. And then in Romans 4, verses 22 through 25, Paul writes, And because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous, and when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit, it was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us as righteous. If we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was handed over to die because of our sins, and he was raised to life to make us right with God. This is an imputed righteousness meaning God gives it to us as a gift. Romans 5 and verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then in Romans 5 verses 8 and 9, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. But then we see the concept of hunger and thirst. When Jesus spoke of hungering and thirsting, he was referring to the powerful motivation of a starving person who would give up anything for a scrap of food, or someone who was dying of thirst and would give anything for just one drop of water. 
Now this first century audience that he was speaking to on the mountain fully understood what he meant by this. However, it is unlikely that any of us have ever experienced extreme hunger and thirst. For example, when I was young, I can remember coming home from school and always thinking that I was starving, but I really wasn't. I can remember times when I was very thirsty and thought I was going to die of thirst, but I never was really that thirsty. Friends, nothing we have experienced compares with the way that many people lived in biblical times. Laborers barely made enough to feed their families. When they were hurt or sick and could not work, they received no pay at all. They had to listen to their hungry children crying in the night, and it's still that way in many places today. We also do not understand what it means to be really, really thirsty. All we have to do is turn a knob and water comes out. This was not true in Bible lands. Their water came from wells and from streams, but wells and streams can dry up. When people traveled across the desert lands of the Middle East, they often had to go long distances without water, and they understood thirst far better than we ever will. This intense desire that Jesus is describing was illustrated by two tragic events in history. First, we see the famine that is described in 2 Kings 6 and verse 25, where it says, As a result, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. But the most tragic result of this famine is found in 2 Kings 6, verses 26 through 29. One day as the king of Israel was walking along the wall of the city, a woman called to him, Please help me, my lord, the king. He answered, If the lord doesn't help you, what can I do? I have neither food from the threshing floor nor wine from the press to give you. But then the king answered, What is the matter? She replied, This woman said to me, Come on, let's eat your son today. Then we will eat my son tomorrow. So we cooked my son and ate him. Then the next day I said to her, Kill your son so we can eat him. But she has hidden her son. Friends, as strong as a mother's love is, in that mother, the drive of hunger was stronger. Another example was the siege of Jerusalem by Titus in AD 70. The Jewish historian Josephus reported this about that siege. Throughout the city, people were dying of hunger in large numbers and enduring unspeakable sufferings. In every house, the merest hint of food sparked violence and close relatives fell to blows, snatching from one another the pitiful supports of life. No respect was paid even to the dying. The ruffians searched them in case they were concealing food somewhere in their clothes or just pretending to be near death. Gaping with hunger like mad dogs, lawless gangs went staggering and reeling through the streets, battering upon the doors like drunkards, and so bewildered that they broke into the same house two or three times in an hour. Need drove the starving to gnaw at anything. Refuse, which even animals would reject, was collected and turned into food. In the end, they were eating belts and shoes and the leather stripped off of their shell, uh, off of their shields. Tufts of withered grass were devoured and sold in little bundles for four drachmas. Among the residents of the region beyond Jordan was a woman called Mary, daughter of Eleazar of the village of Bethzuba, which name means house of hyssop. She was well off and of good family and had fled to Jerusalem with her relatives when she became involved with this siege. Most of the property she had packed up and brought with her from Perea. This, though, had been plundered by the tyrants. And the rest of her treasure, together with such foods as she had been able to procure, was being carried off by the henchmen in the daily raids. In her bitter resentment, this poor woman cursed and abused these extortioners, and this incensed them against her. 
However, no one put her to death, either from exasperation or pity. She grew weary of trying to find food for her family. In any case, it was now impossible to get any. Wherever you tried, there was no food to be had. Famine gnawed at her vitals, and the fire of rage was fiercer than famine. So driven by fury and want, she committed a crime against nature. Seizing her infant child, she cried, My poor baby, why should I keep you alive in this world of war and famine? Even if we live till the Romans come, they will make slaves of us, and anyway, hunger will get us before slavery does, and the rebels are crueler than both. Come, be food for me, and an avenging fury to the rebels, and a tale of cold horror to the world to complete the monstrous agony of the Jews. And with these words, she killed her son and ate her son. But the rebels were on her at once. They knew what was taking place. But she said, This is my own child, my own handiwork. Eat, for I have eaten already. Do not show yourselves weaker than a woman or more pitiful than a mother. But if you have pious scruples and shrink away from human sacrifice, then what I have eaten can count as your share, and I will eat what's left as well. And at that, they slunk away, trembling, not daring to eat, although they were reluctant to yield even this food to the mother. The whole city soon rang with this abomination, and when people heard it, they shuddered as though they had done it themselves. Now, folks, I know that this is graphic. I know that the words that I just shared with you are hard to hear, and it's hard to imagine that someone would ever get to the point that they were driven that mad by hunger. But that's what took place in A.D. 70. That is hunger. Now, friends, to be a true Christian in good standing with God, we must have a deep craving and intense heart hunger and thirst for God himself. If our strongest desire is to live right and have that vital relationship with God, then we will be satisfied. Psalm 42, verses 1 through 2 says, As the deer pants for the water of brooks, so pants my soul after you. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before my God? Now, many passages teach that God's word is what provides food for the soul. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The author of Hebrews also says in Hebrews 5, verses 12 through 14, that God's word contains both milk for immature Christians and solid food for the mature. So for the soul to be nourished, it is not merely enough to read and study the word, but we must also do what the word of God says. Jesus said in John 4 and verse 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me. In James 1, 21 through 22, So get rid of all the filth and the evil in your lives and humbly accept the word that God has planted in your hearts, for it has the power to save your souls. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says, otherwise you are only fooling yourselves. Our souls are also nourished by spending time with God in prayer and by drawing closer to Jesus. John 6 and verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Our souls are nourished also as we worship and associate with our brothers and sisters in Christ. But the question that each of us have to ask ourselves is this, do I have an intense hunger and thirst for God? Do I have an intense hunger and thirst to serve God, to do things His way, and to follow only His will? Friends, these are things that we need to consider, for only we can answer that question for ourselves today. Are you hungering and thirsting after righteousness? If so, you can find it in God's word. 
turn to the Word of God today. Study it. Obey it. Make contact with us at the Pyburn Street Church of Christ. And let us assist you in getting your life right with God, standing justified in His sight. Friends, we thank you for joining us for our program today. And have a blessed Lord's Day.